White dwarfs, the remnants of dead stars, hold masses comparable to our sun, but are similar in size to Earth. 97% of all stars will eventually become a white dwarf, making them a rather future common occurrence. As stars reach the end of their life cycles, their cores collapse into these dense celestial objects, transforming our galaxy into what can be seen as a sort of ethereal graveyard. Despite their prevalence, the chemical composition of white dwarfs has puzzled astronomers for years, particularly the presence of heavy metals like silicon, magnesium, and calcium on their surfaces. To better understand the chemical composition of these stars, Jilla graduate student and astrophysical researcher Tatsuya Akiba, along with Jilla Fellow and University of Colorado Boulder Associate Professor of Planetary and Astrophysical Sciences Anne-Marie Madigan, and Jilla undergraduate student Sayla McIntyre, have been using computer simulations to unravel the mysteries of these stellar zombies. The results, published recently in the Astrophysical Journal Letters, can be read more about in our Research Highlight tab on the Jilla website. In this episode, you'll get more of a behind-the-scenes look as I sit down with Akiba to learn more about the research, which enhances our understanding of white dwarfs and provides a window into the future of our solar system and others. You're listening to Humans of Jilla, a Jilla podcast focusing on the human narrative of the institution's researchers. I'm your host and science communicator, Kenna hughes Cassaberry. Every month, I tell the story of a researcher or a group within Jilla, showcasing the human sides behind the science. If you enjoyed today's episode, please like it on our YouTube channel or follow us on Spotify, and be sure to share it with your friends and family. This episode features an interview with Jilla graduate student Tatsuya Akiba. So whether you're a physicist enthusiast, a current Jilla member, part of Jilla's vast alumni network, or considering Jilla as the next step in your career, stay tuned as we dive into the cutting-edge astrophysical research happening at our institute. Let's begin our story. Like many other researchers within Jilla, Madigan and Akiba are fascinated by the gravitational effects on objects, particularly celestial ones like black holes or white dwarf stars. While Madigan was unable to be interviewed for this episode, she did remark in Jilla's recent research highlight about her work that, quote, the vast majority of planets in the universe will end up orbiting a white dwarf. It could be that 50% of these systems get eaten by their star, including our own solar system, end quote. For their part, Akiba explains a bit more about how these stars form and why they are so common in our universe. Hi, uh, my name is Tatsuya Akiba. I am a PhD candidate in the Astrophysical and Planetary Sciences Department uh, here at CU Boulder. And I'm obviously also a research assistant um, over at JILA, um, working with Anne-Marie Madigan, who's a professor in the same department. And I am going into my sixth and hopefully final year um, <laughs> here. Uh, so, so yeah, fingers crossed. And <laughs> that's, yeah. that's just a little bit about me and my research. So white dwarfs are sort of the end stage uh, of a star's lifetime or, or one of the possibilities that stars can, can uh, end up in. And specifically, uh, low to medium mass stars. Um, so obviously stars come in a bunch of different masses. Um, but when I say low to medium mass, some, somewhere below eight uh, solar masses, so eight times the mass of the sun, um, any sort of star that's below that threshold uh, will eventually end, end their life uh, as a, a white dwarf. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, it actually con constitutes about 97% or so of, of stars you know, in our galaxy will, not right now, but will eventually end, end their life as a white dwarf. Um, yeah. That, that sounds really important since they're everywhere. <laughs> um, so could you tell us a little bit about, like, why you wanted to study the white dwarf dynamics? Of course. Um, so one of the uh, big open questions uh, right now is uh, white dwarfs, uh, when we observe uh, sort of their, their spectrum, so kind of studying the composition of, of the atmosphere, of white dwarfs, we see a lot of uh, heavier elements that we don't necessarily expect to, to see. And so uh, the reason that we don't expect to see it, uh, first of all, is the fact that white dwarfs are uh, really dense because, le like I said, you know, it's the sort of the death of the star, right? And the, the core of the star kind of collapses into this, this dense ball. And when that happens, the surface gravity of the white dwarf is, you know, so strong that you can actually get a differentiated structure. So all the heavier elements actually sink towards the, the center. 
and just lighter elements like hydrogen and helium will remain in, in the atmosphere. And that's, you know, the extent of where we can observe. And so we, we only really expect to see hydrogen and helium. But when we actually go out and observe these white dwarfs, a lot of them, uh, so the, the fraction is also kind of debated, but somewhere uh, between 25 to 50 percent, so somewhere from a quarter to a half of white dwarfs seem to be uh, metal polluted, as they say. So um, they're polluted by these heavier elements. And so that's sort of the uh, observation that is yet uh, unexplained, or there's a lot of, you know, uh, theories that are out there. And so as a, as a theoretician uh, myself, I wanted to come along and, and work with Anne-Marie to come up with a theory that can maybe explain, you know, how, how this pollution is happening. Cool. Can you tell me a little bit about the theory you guys came up with and how you got to where you ended up? Right. Um, so uh, I guess for a little bit of context, uh, Amory and I uh, love to do uh, dynamics, uh, which is basically, you know, just how astrophysical objects interact with each other through gravity. And one way to study that is through n-body simulations. Let me back up a little bit and, and talk a little bit, I guess, more about the pollution. One thing that is really interesting is that when, when we see these white, dwarf, uh, that white, white dwarfs that are polluted, the metal needs to have come from somewhere else pretty recently um, because the white dwarfs, uh, if there was any sort of heavy element uh, present on the surface at the time that it was you know, uh, birthed, then uh, all of those elements should have sunk to the core already. And so we need a recent accretion event in order to explain this uh, signal. And so one way to explain that is if there are uh, planetary bodies around the white dwarf, you can throw these planetary bodies um, at the white dwarf, and the white dwarf can accrete from that surrounding planetary uh, material. And uh, yeah, the process that we kind of started to look at was to get these uh, smaller planetary bodies surrounding the white dwarf to become really, really highly eccentric. And when that happens, the uh, planetary body comes in at such a close distance to the white dwarf that it actually gets tidally disrupted. So the white dwarf's gravity is too strong, and the smaller planetary body, an asteroid, comet, whatever... Uh, is not able to hold itself together anymore. And so it, it becomes a bunch of debris, and that that can explain a sort of the signature um, once the white dwarf has accreted that. Um, so with that sort of background, um, the mechanism that we sort of came up with is kind of using the fact uh, that white dwarfs actually get a small kick uh, when it's born due to sort of uh, losing the outer layers of the star at the very end of its life. And so um, there's a giant star at the end of its life, and then the outer layer is spewed out, and then the core collapses into a white dwarf, uh, roughly speaking. And the outer layers can be lost in sort of this asymmetric way. And so the white dwarf gets sort of a baby kick, um, you know, in the opposite direction um, to sort of conserve the momentum. And this kick, uh, uh, one of the, the mechanisms that my kind of thesis work has, has focused on is dynamics uh, surrounding kicks uh, in general. And so we applied this white dwarf kick in, in our n-body simulations and, and saw what happened to the smaller, you know, assuming that there's a sort of a pool of smaller planetary bodies surrounding the white dwarf, what happens to the orbits. And it turns out that uh, you can form uh, an eccentric disk. So if you have you know, initially a circular uh, disk with planetary bodies that do not sort of have any sort of preferential direction, the kick is actually going to create a, a, a lopsided disk where you have a bunch of eccentric orbits now where the eccentric orbits are all sort of aligned in along one, one axis. And that eccentric disk is actually uh, able to uh, create these tidal disruption events that, that might be able to explain the pollution signal. To better understand the dynamics around white dwarf stars, astrophysicists like Madigan and Akiba use a computer simulations to determine various stellar interactions within our universe. Computer simulations are crucial in astrophysical research as they provide a virtual laboratory where scientists can model complex celestial phenomena that are impossible to replicate or observe directly. These simulations allow researchers to manipulate variables and test hypotheses in a controlled environment offering insights into the behaviors and interactions of astronomical objects over extended periods. Yeah, uh, so we ended up running 2,500 simulations. <laughs> but uh, <That's> a lot. <laughs> I, Yes, uh, but that, that was just sort of to, to explore the parameter space a little bit. 
Um, so of course, uh, if we you know make the assumption of uh, if it's a, a sort of a well-behaved planetary system, we expect some somewhere similar to, to our solar system, right? So there's like a well-defined disk, and everything is nicely rotating in one direction. Orbits are roughly circular. Um, there are some eccentric uh, bodies, obviously. Um, so under that assumption, there are still uh, other parameters that we can play around with. Uh, one of them in particular is the kick. Um, and so we have, you have, we have to pick, you know, how, how big the kick is supposed to be and in what direction with respect to that disc. Right. So we can get a uh, more in-plane kick or a more out-of-plane kick. And it's how, it turns out for this uh, lopsided, you know, eccentric disc formation, in-plane kicks are, are better at creating these uh, lopsided modes. But uh, lucky for us, uh, if you kind of distribute that uh, vector randomly in 3D space, it turns out that in-plane kicks are more likely to begin with. Um, so just to, yeah, explore that parameter space, we ran a bunch of simulations. And then towards the uh, end of sort of the, the paper that, that just came out um, uh, in, I think, April or, or May, um, that uh, the later parts of the paper focused more on one particular case um, and kind of running it for, for longer in the simulation to see, see what happens um, and if there's sort of a stable, you know, sort of a solution. Madigan echoed Akiba's thoughts in the research highlight, stating, quote, This is something I think is unique about our theory. We can explain why the accretion events are so long-lasting. While other mechanisms may explain an original accretion event, our simulations with the kick show why it still happens hundreds of millions of years later, end quote. I then asked Akiba about some of the bigger implications and next steps for the project. Right. Um, and this is, uh, you know, I want to preface this with, uh, I'm not, the one who came up with this idea, sure. um, but the one of the import, big important things about studying polluted white dwarfs is that um, because whatever you know planetary body that got tidally disrupted gets gets disrupted and then now it's it's uh, accreted and we can see it on the uh, sort of the surface of the white dwarf um, when we take a, a spectrum. It, it's actually a really great and, and unique way to sort of study the composition of these exoplanetary bodies. Um, as sort of, it, it, it's it's cool because it's as it's being eaten, we can finally kind of study its, you know, how, what what it was made of, sure. um, because it shows up as as lines uh, on the white dwarf spectrum. And so, one thing that uh, our mechanism can sort of provide is a sense of, you know, where in the disk are these smaller bodies coming from. Um, and, and so by connecting our theory, we can, uh, make future predictions for, um, rates of these white dwarf polluters, um, coming in and then also the composition, um, if by linking it to the observations that we have, we might be able to study, uh, white dwarf exoplanetary systems a little bit better. Um, yeah. Yeah. That sounds really important. What are some of kind of the next steps for this project, if you have any? So... Uh, there are there are many uh, things that we can we can do to improve on on the current work. Um, one of them in particular is how uh, in, in our current study we assumed this. You know, I, I think I, I mentioned it earlier. Uh, this this idea that everything is nice and circular, and you have you know just smaller bodies in these nice circular orbits, and that's not necessarily true. And we can. Uh, we actually know this uh, from studying our solar system. For example, we have you know four giant planets, and because of their giant those giant planets in sort of this outer uh, uh, solar system, we have smaller bodies in uh, eccentric orbits sometimes, not circular ones, and in a particular sort of structure. Um, and so we might, um, in particular, we have a the scattered disk, uh, which is a structure that's created by Neptune. And um, I think it's important to to mention. Um, also, that the white dwarf kick is expected to be pretty small. And so if you sort of map out this kick magnitude, the spatial kind of scale that we expect to see this eccentric disk is actually uh, pretty far away. Um, so, um, yeah, in our simulations, we get somewhere between uh, 30 AU, which is where Neptune is, to hundreds of AU, which is, you know, three or four times um, where Neptune is from the, from the sun. Um, and in that sort of region, in our solar system, at least, we see the scattered disk, which is a disk of smaller bodies that's been scattered out by, by Neptune. And because of the scattering process, you actually get a very particular eccentricity profile. Um, and that 
you know, obviously doesn't exist in our simulation right now. Um, but just inputting a giant planet um, right. would be would be really interesting to see if that changes the dynamics uh, of this mechanism of the white dwarf getting a kick and changing the orbits. Um, and if that changes the rates of the white dwarf polluters coming in or anything like that. And then another sort of uh, interesting aspect of this project is uh, so one, one thing that we haven't really looked at, uh, we focus uh, on, on going in, but not what's being thrown out. Oh, um, and so that's really interesting because, you know, in our solar system, we've gotten a few interstellar visitors now, like Oumuamua, for example. Um, and it's got a weird structure. It could be an <laughs> alien spaceship, you know, all, that, all that stuff. <laughs> Um, and so one thing that would be interesting is, you know, if we look at these white dwarf systems, um, which are obviously outside of the solar system, can we get uh, weird looking, you know, asteroids like shards that get thrown out uh, of, of that system because of this process, right, uh, of, of the kick and getting eccentric orbits? So that's that's another kind of avenue that we want to explore in the future. Great. Cool. Um, so just kind of a more general, broad question. Was there anything you really enjoyed about this project or were really surprised by that you just had no idea about? Yeah. Um, so one thing that I really enjoy, and this is in, in, in general sort of about uh, studying dynamics in general, is that uh, especially end body simulations, a lot of things in astrophysics interact with each other through gravity. Right. And so um, I actually uh, come from more of a, you know, a star cluster uh, background. And so I was initially at least more interested in you know, supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies and these star clusters that exist around it. Um, but uh, what's sort of in common between that system and, for example, this white dwarf and smaller planetary bodies system is that there is one massive body right at the center that's sort of dominating the gravitational field. But you have these smaller bodies that can still interact with each other gravitationally. And you can study these both of these systems actually fairly sim in a similar way using antibody simulations. And so one thing that was that was really interesting is, uh, especially with the kicks, uh, white dwarf skit kicks, but there's a lot of astrophysical objects that get kicks. Sure. And so one one part of dynamics that I really enjoy is uh, this aspect of being able to kind of like dabble in different fields and and, and cross uh, fields within astrophysics, and and sort of study the same thing. And then in certain contexts, you get uh, you get a different consequence out of it. So in this case, you get white dwarf pollution out of it. Um, and in, in the supermassive black hole case, you get something completely different, but the dynamics are kind of the same, um, which is something that I really enjoy, yeah, with what I do. Thank you for listening to Humans of Jilla, a Jilla podcast. Be sure to subscribe to Jilla's YouTube channel for more information, or subscribe to Spotify to keep listening to these episodes. This episode features an interview with Jilla graduate student Tatsuya Akiba. You can read about Akiba's and Madigan's research project in the article linked in our show notes. Production design, sound design, and research by Kenna Hughes Castleberry, with assistance from Jilla's Science Communication Office and the Madigan Group. Sounds and music by Pixabay and Kevin MacLeod. Jilla is a joint institute between NIST and the University of Colorado Boulder. Jilla hosts this podcast. Any use of this podcast without Jilla's permission or credit is prohibited.